I'm live. Look at that. Hi. <clears throat> oh, yeah, it's happening. Okay. Hello. Hi. Out there. Let me just check my surroundings. So, hello, everybody. This is Living For Me. Um, as you can tell, I am very inexperienced with YouTube. Um, and then, okay, so why go live? Because I don't have time to record a video. But um, I'm here as more an experiment for myself. Um, <laughs> I look so amateurish. Number one, it's dark. Um, number two, I, I won't give much of an intro, uh, cause this is really an experiment for myself. Oh, I had one person they left. That's fine. Um, this is an experiment for myself, but I'm just giving a little bit of intro in case somebody runs across this video. So in case it helps you for whatever reason, um, I don't even know what to title it, but anyway, um, using these videos to help me kind of digest my nutritional information, my nutritional studies. So I'll be recording myself basically studying. So as you can see from the title, the title is uh, basically about food safety. And uh, with food safety, it's like one of the reasons why I don't eat out because people, sometimes certain restaurants, well, don't eat out everywhere. You have to be careful because um, not everybody practices food safety. But anyway, I'm going to studying whatever the intro is. But if you come across this video, it's just me studying. So there goes that. All right. Uh, so, uh, okay. Foodborne illness. This is a simple one. So um, it's caused basically by pathogens. You know, pathogens are anything that's disease causing, um, like bacteria, viruses, anything of that sort. Um, and food, another word for foodborne illness is, um, as we know, commonly known as uh, food poisoning. So with food poisoning, there's many reasons why food poisoning happens. Um, food poisoning can happen, you know, obviously uh, through bacteria, through viruses. Um, and then uh, obviously the, through bacteria and viruses, which are commonly known as pathogens. Um, pathogens, what are examples of path pathogens? So there's mold, there's parasites, um, worms, which are basically parasites, um, and bacteria. Am I missing anything? Oh, and then there's also another cause for foodborne illness um, are toxins. Yes. All right. So what is the risk of foodborne illnesses or who is at risk for foodborne illness? So anyone with a basically compromised immune system, and that is typically, we think of young kids, young children, and um, the elderly. Uh, those are obvious ones. Um, others are, um, let's see if I can remember. Uh, go, those going through chemotherapy, and then um try not to look at my notes those who went through chemotherapy basically those who have vulnerable um illnesses oh malnourished see oh pregnant woman yeah pregnant woman malnourished all right basically those with weakened immune systems all right so uh some of the bacteria basically we're no no how does microorganisms in food cause illness? Oh, we talked about, well, we haven't talked about that. Um, infection and intoxication. 
intoxication. Two actually different ways. Um, infection having to do with the microorganism um, infecting uh, the tissues in the body directly. Because if, um, infection is directly affecting the tissues in the body. Intoxication, in intoxication is uh, where the microorganism creates a toxin, right? Yeah. Yeah, it creates a toxin uh, or produces, I should use it, produces a toxin. Right. So there's those two methods of um, um, a foodborne illness. Okay, so um, just some examples here, just personal notes that um, I don't need to get to. Um, Whenever that, oh yeah, actually one interesting thing that I learned today um, is that at the extreme, uh, for those who are very vulnerable, they can basically, I mean, along with the other symptoms, they can experience death, um, which seems really um, dark, uh, abrupt, but yes, you can experience death, death can occur, uh, with those who have weak immune systems. And um, one interesting note that I wrote down that I learned, I guess, so when you're pregnant uh, or a pregnant woman has inherently, uh, not inherently, but um, the body has um, adapted to um, making sure the woman's immune system lowers or in lower or is a weakened weakened so that the body doesn't recognize the like growing baby as uh as some type of foreign uh I don't want to say object but did I write down exactly or basically attack the baby or reject the baby um in her body so I thought that was really interesting that you know pregnant woman's uh, immune system weakens just so that the body doesn't feel like um, this baby is some foreign um, or some or attacks the baby and allows the baby to kind of develop and go through all the steps. So I thought that was interesting. All right. So what else do I need to know? All right. So what causes um, foodborne illness? We talked about that. Oh, no. I didn't. Um, enteric. Enteric having to do with the digestive system. Oh, enteric to toxins. So toxins that affect the digestive system. So enteric toxins. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, viruses that can be treated with antibiotic. That's a separate note. Okay. So neurovirus. Oh, I got it. So enteric toxins are toxins that affect the digestive system and uh, those that infect the digestive system um, uh, can lead to neuroviruses, those toxins, um, which have to do with like, the nervous system. And then there's parasites and parasites are um, like single celled um, organisms, usually not very, not visible at all. Um, not at all visible to the naked eye. Um, there are a few that are like worms, certain worms. Um, in America, we don't, oh, what happened? All right, in America, we don't have worms, but, or don't have a lot of cases of worms. Um, but they do in other countries, um, especially where my family is from. Probably not anymore. So we used to take tea, you like take bitter tea to get rid of the worms and clear it out. But um, parasites, yeah, require a host. It's basic. You can't see. Uh, oh, so another side note, not side note, but um, example of, oh no, that's later. All right, so building up on parasites um, or um, are worms. One in particular 
uh, what is it called? Anasakis. Anasaki? I don't know if I'm saying that right. Anasaki. Anasaki Simplex. So Anasaki Simplex, if I'm saying that right at all, um, is a round worm, round, round worm. Anasaki is a round worm um, in contaminated raw fish, um, basically, and then, you know, sushi. So this Anasaki um, worm or simplex round worm can live in your small intestine. Oh yeah. You can live in your small intestine for years, like years, a month, uh, usually long periods of time. And you'll experience, um, you will experience all your symptoms. So if you have, um, I don't know, constant pain or discomfort, I think there's like tickling or, um, uh, stomach issues, like hard to um, digest food. It kind of lived in the wall of your intestine and that could be quite uncomfortable. And that's that Anasaki worm that comes from raw fish, which is um, potentially in sushi. And one thing, um, actually she was saying that you can see this, um, a lot of parasites you cannot see. They're very small, they're microscopic, single celled organisms. Um, and you cannot see majority of them, but with the Anasaki worm, you can see it. And like, if you get sushi, um, first of all, I wouldn't get sushi. Like people get sushi at the supermarket and at all the most random places. Like it's raw fish. Like you would want the best Japanese um, chef to prepare, you know, your sushi. I, I'm not judging, but I just, I don't understand why you get sushi at the supermarket. But unless it's a Japanese supermarket. I just, anyway, um, <laughs> what was I saying? Oh yeah. So you can see, you can, um, see the parasites on, uh, or you see the Anasaki worm um, on the sushi. So to look like from what she's telling me, I, I don't know. I, oops. Anyway, um, this experiment is very interesting. Um, so it looks like little dots, little white dots. Like even if you like see bad food, it has a little spore, looks like spores. So on the fish itself, it'll be white dots and that they won't necessarily move. But that is an indication that it's the Anasaki, Anasaki worm, uh, Anasaki worm that um, does not leave your digestive system. All right, so something to be aware of. Um, all right, so next one uh, that also causes foodborne illness. So first one we talked about is the enteric toxins. Um, that result in neuroviruses that affect your nervous system. The second thing we talk about is parasites. These are single-celled um, organisms that you won't be able to see. Um, we didn't talk about how parasites come about. Um, did we? Maybe we did. I have to go back in my notes again. But um, All right, so I'll do that. But parasites, and then the third, we talked about worms, and specifically, and worms are parasites, but specifically we talked about the Anasaki um, worm, which uh, lives in, um, is usually found in raw fish and uh, sushi most commonly, and that we can actually see that parasite. So those were standout notes. Um, the fourth is prions. It's the first time I heard of that. Prions. Prions is how do you do a protein, isn't it? Okay. It's an altered protein that's resilient. So an example of that is um, a mad cow disease, which a uh, scientific name or official name is okay, bovine 
Oh, I didn't write this right. Bovine spongiforum, I believe. I have to check my slides. Okay, bovine spongiflorum. Um, and bovine uh, is reference to cow. So like feline, bovine, feline having to do with cat, I mean cats, bovine um, having to do with cows, just like word association to remember. So bovine sp spongiforum is um, the term for mad cow disease, which is a form of prions. Here we go. Okay. Okay, form of prions. And so yeah, example is mad cow disease. All right. Uh, I wrote some really basic notes. I need to go back. Um, or did she not talk about it? She probably talked about it and I just said I'd go to slide. But anyway, let's move forward in this experiment. Oh, so bovine spongiforum. Uh, oh, there's a hole in the brain of the cow. Causes a hole in the brain of the cow. I wonder what brings on prions though. Or just something that naturally occurs in the cow. Um, it's interesting. Yeah. All right, so moving on from prions or the the cause, main causes. All right, so the next um, note here is what are the three requirements of disease causing bacteria? So what what is required to you know obviously have a bacteria thrive? And the first is warmth. Obviously, um, or not obviously, but that's I already knew that. Um, so warmth, and that is so bacteria thrives in forty to one hundred and forty uh, degrees Fahrenheit, and that is technically danger zone. And in most restaurants, uh, or like just uh, food spaces where there's cafeteria, uh, a school, or a restaurant, um, or any. Um, place with food preparation. Um, it's actually four, I think it's 41 to 140, but she said 40 to one, it's 41 to 140, but she says 40 to one, 40 to 140, if you're going to remember it like that, is the temperature bacteria needs to, to thrive. So that's the warmth um, the, in the danger zone. Moisture, so any wet environments, um, obviously, so when you get foodborne illness, aka food poisoning, um, so when it gets in your gut, it's warm there, it's wet there. Um, and then the third is nutrients. So it's like your gut, your stomach is a perfect place um, for for um, bacteria to survive, to th survive and thrive. Um, because, yeah, which is a leading cause for all the vomiting, um, pain, nausea, all those you're experiencing, uh, those symptoms you're experiencing is because of the perfect conditions that bacteria, bacteria, uh, the gut satisfies the, <laughs> the conditions needed for bacteria the gut, the stomach satisfies or allows bacteria to survive, gives it the perfect conditions for it to survive. <sighs> okay, let's get through it. All right, so I think I got that clear. All right, what are the safe, um, what are safe food? What are I right here? Mm -hmm. Oh, what's safe food handling techniques? Um, so always use a thermometer, always chill foods. These are things I know. I don't think I need to study. This is a really easy class or today's class was pretty basic. Um, so always use a thermometer, always chill foods in shallow, not deep containers. Um, the reason why shallow allows for frozen foods. So you have like meat, you know, like, in my family, or I mean, I don't really cook meat, but if I do cook meat, 
just leave it in the refrigerator, obviously on the bottom of the refrigerator because the top, the juices will trickle down or can trickle down. Um, I grew up always like, you know, I mean, you don't know, but putting, you put your meats in the sink or you put it on the counter, on the counter. And that allows the danger zone to set in and um, food bon bon foodborne illness to be a concern. But we've never gotten sick at home and we've done that. But anyway, not what I'm learning today, um, or at least formally. So always chill in shallow because shallow deep dishes allow um, could allow that perfect conditions like the warmth. Um, keep raw foods separate, um, meaning preventing uh, cross contaminations. Yeah, so keeping raw foods separate from um, cooked foods or even meat from vegetables. This is like stuff I don't need to record from my self study because. All right, so food storage. Oh, let's skip that. That's pretty straightforward. Um, avoid. Foodborne illnesses like traveling. Oh, while traveling. Yeah. So, yeah, this is important. Um, but really self explanatory. Since I'm doing a video, and it's like, I mean, it's really for me, but um, one person's watching. Since you, since someone, someone's listening, that's fine. Um, thank you for joining me on my self study. Um, self-study experiment. Um, uh, where am I? Okay, yes. So while traveling, you only want to drink uh, bottled water. Um, you don't want to drink. This is hard because if you go somewhere, the food is cooked with water, it's washed with the water. So you travel to another country. So you can but so much avoid it. You almost have to just eat the food and you know, hope that the water in the food is not going to get you sick um, or, you know, and, and just let it run its course, stay hydrated with bottled water, of course, not, and ice is another thing that I think people forget that ice, when you're abroad, don't put, don't have them put ice in your drinks because obviously that is the water frozen. You just want to Stay consistent with bottled water. Stay hydrated with bottled water. All right, so avoid beef products. I think in meats in general is like fresh um, fruits and veggies. I think that's hard. I think depending on how long you're staying somewhere, um, your body will adjust. But for my cases, for my self-study experiment um, here... Avoid ice, avoid fresh foods and uh, veggies, um, avoid beef products. Okay. How do manufacturers prevent contamination? Anyway. All right. So I need to know that manufacturers basically have food handling techniques, um, kind of... Uh, administered from the FDA. Uh, so those that's where their guidelines come from, Food and Drug Administration. Uh, food production, basically, and preservation and um, packaging, that plays a huge part in preventing food uh, contamination. And a uh, few are salting, smoking, drying, fermenting, so a lot of those foods, salting is like an ancient technique. A lot of people do that. Um, not a lot of people do that. Certain cultures do that. Um, to or, or at least um, in the original days before refrigerators, salting was used to preserve um, foods. So let them last longer, especially, you know, after catching game and things like that. Um, so it's, it's an original method, but what manufacturers are doing now is just salting, providing salted products and people are not 
they're, they're not preparing it right. They're not like removing the sodium. And sometimes so much sodium gets absorbed and we're not living the same lifestyle. So I thought it was important. Um, I'm sure she's not going to test us on this, but it's interesting. So salting back then, we didn't have any refrigerators. We didn't have any ways of keeping the meat um, uh, from spoiling. So we had all this extra, I'm sure they had all this extra sodium. I, I don't know if they washed it off. I don't know the exact um, methods. I don't want to speak to it too much, but I'm sure their lifestyle was a lot different. So they were a lot more lot, um, active. They're probably drinking more water than we, we do. Um, so there was a balance there that I think we don't have today. So adopting those ancient techniques are good, but also if your lifestyle doesn't match that ancient technique, it kind of just doesn't, it, I don't think it works. I mean, that's my theory. I don't think it works. If you're, if you're living that same lifestyle as they lived, obviously if you have that lineage and you're living the same lifestyle, you're very active or whatever it is, whether it's like hunting or I don't know what I think. Yeah. I understand what I'm saying. So, okay. All right. Smoking, smoking the foods, obviously barbecue, all those things are meant to preserve, but they smoking foods, is a carcinogen. So it is cost cancer causing. Um, people do it. Um, or don't even know that it's cancer causing, which is another thing. All right, drying, fermenting. You know, some people love fermenting, but um, that is a way to preserve foods. A heat treatment. So I always wanted, to, I wondered about this. So you see the box. Uh, so I love oat milk. I love oat milk. Um, oh my gosh. Why do I whine? And anyway, um, so oat milk, so milk in general, but I like oat milk. Some say oat milk is in the refrigerator. Even regular milk is in the refrigerator. So, um, but sometimes in a grocery store, you'd see the box, um, the box milk. So it's not in the refrigerator. It's just in a, like a, like a square box, like a long rect rectangular box. And, um, and I always wonder, I see the ingredients and I don't see any preserving, um, ingredients on the box that's different from the one that's on the shelf. So I always wondered why, why is that? Why is that almond milk or you know, oat milk can live on the shelf, but then there's also one in the refrigerator. Like, what's the difference? Um, so um, my professor was explaining that it, um, one of the pres preservation me methods is heat treating. So what they do with the milk is they heat treat it. So they basically heat it up to just a ridiculous um, uh, um, temperature. I mean, ridiculous as in just high high temperature, that way it kills off any um, bacteria, any um, likelihood of uh, bacteria creeping in or whatever existing, it, it's there. Um, and that's how it's able to survive. So um, all that bacteria is killed off and any potential bacteria will not be able to, um, to form. So I thought that was really interesting. So the, um, those boxes, those um, uh, rectangle, long rectangle boxes of milk are heat treated. All right, cold treatment. That's just freezing. Um, oh, this is a new one. Irradiation. Irradiation. I hope I'm saying this right. I'm sure it is. Irradiation. Um, I don't think it's... So it's basically adding radiation to preserve. And I didn't know that was even possible. So they add... They um, use radiation as a technique to preserve the food. And uh, remember when in one of our slides, it has um, strawberries. Because, you know, strawberries, strawberries, you know, I mean, give it a, like two days and the strawberries are already like decomposing and soft, which is good. I think 
um, for the purposes of maybe other people watching this, if they want. I don't know. Um, strawberries or food period decomposing is not a bad thing. Like it's actually good. Your food should decompose. And, you know, I brought up in class that um, the preserving methods that they're using for breads now, you know what, one topic. So back to the strawberries. So radiation, what is it called? Ir irradiation, if that's how you would say it. <laughs> All right, irradiation. <laughs> adding, radi <laughs> adding radiation to preserve. Um, yeah, so we're back to the strawberries. So if you see strawberries or strawberries that you've purchased and they're still perfect, I mean, they should have a sign. Uh, there's a symbol that says they've been treated with radiation and it actually looks like a, I don't know why I'm drawing with my fingers. Like you can see it. I don't have a pen, but it looks like a flower coming out in a circle and then like a leaf, not a flower, a leaf and a circle. And it's interesting because I used to work in advertising and, you know, those things, I look at the logo and I'm like, that logo looks so welcoming and nice and um, it's earthy and radiation is not earthy. So I just, you know, anyway, people have to be careful or it's a lot of education around food that I'm sure people don't care about. That's why you're going to see a person like me uh, to tell you. You're going to have a nutritionist or a, di a dietitian to tell you. But um, it's because it's a lot of information. It's, and it's almost insane because the logo looks so welcoming and nice. It looks like, oh, that looks like holistic. And it's like green and white. It's a nice um, foster green. I mean, nobody cares. Nobody's looking at it like I'm looking at it from a like a creative sense. But when you're passing by the super, by the aisle or the product, it looks very inviting and nice. It doesn't look like danger radiation, which what it should look like is not yellow and black or red or anything like that. Nothing that or or yellow, which are like alerting you know, danger because it's radiation. So imagine just for your strawberries to be fresh, you're going to eat uh, radio radioactive treated strawberries. It just uh, do what you want. But, um, but if you pay to come see me, I'll tell you. Obviously, I'll let you know the truth. <sighs> Once I pass these classes. All right. So all right, how many pages do I have? I want to work with this. All right, so toxins, residues, and contaminants in food. Oh, I forgot to talk about bread. So, yeah, the bread, going back to pre preservation of food. Um, so another thing is obviously adding preservatives. I mean, there's so many preservatives, and there are even some natural ones out there. But basically what I was pointing out in class is that uh, the preservatives, bread doesn't um, spoil anymore. I don't I mean, I don't buy a lot of bread, but sometimes every now and then I want to make like, you know, a little pita or whatever. And sometimes the bread does not spoil. Bread should spoil. It should go green. It should go bad. And, um, I actually have a bread for like, anyway, I'm not going to talk about that right now, but it's bread should spoil. That's a problem. Cause imagine it doesn't spoil. Then how does your body break it down? Your body should be able to break down food. I mean, minus fiber and other things, but fiber is, is helpful. It's beneficial, but uh, and fiber is a um, natural occurring, um, natural in foods, or or at least plants, not foods, um, plant food, plant based foods. So, and it's beneficial. But if you have something man made going through your body, um, that's not going. If it's not going to decompose in, uh, uh, in um, 
um, outside of your body, how is it going to break down in your body? Like it's a mystery. How? How? how anyway. All right. So um, toxins, residues, and contaminants in food. So um, there's natural toxins in food. So too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Yeah, that's a second. One. So basically one toxin um, in food that's uh, most common that we talked about um, is the one in potatoes called solane. Yeah, solane. Solane. Um, that toxin basically happens over time. So when you buy a potato, um, and a, she didn't say, but I've seen it happen. I know it's toxic, but I didn't know what it was called. So now I know it's so lame. So so lame basically is present when the um, potato skin goes green. And the green, so anytime you see the green um, layer underneath the skin, you either want to take that off completely, um, cut it out, or if the whole thing is green, um, the potato, just throw it away. Um, it is, I forgot what she said it was, and I did not write it down. Can't remember. Anyway, these abbreviated notes. Um, but basically, it's it's toxic, so don't eat it. Um, whenever your potatoes go green, just trash them. And the reason why they go green is not necessarily over time. It's just that they've been in the sun. So um, proper potato storage is um, in a cool place. Same thing with all uh, root vegetables or most, not carrots, but um, most root vegetables like sweet potato um, or just regular, I'm talking about regular potatoes will turn green. Sweet potatoes do not turn green. As, at least as far as I know. Um, but with, um, with this, what was I saying? Sweet potato, potatoes you want to store in a cool place, cool, dark place. So in a bowl, on the bottom shelf, or in the cabinets, um, just out of sunlight, period. Or you could put your potato, sweet potato in sunlight and they grow the roots, and then you can actually put them in the ground, and they grow really pretty flowers. Anyway. Um, all right, so the other thing is that's toxic is just too much of a good thing. Uh, well, we know I know that. Too much of a good thing is a bad thing, basically. What that means is anything in excess is not good, so you need variety. Yeah. Um, another toxin is algae toxins. Um, so this is shellfish. Uh, marine fish. Oh, the example is red tide. It's the algae in the fish tank that causes um, paralysis or uh, um, poisoning. So this is specific to red tide. So that's uh, the algae toxin. So some people do eat like lake or eat drink lake water. Um, so you will develop an algae toxin if that's not Something you're used to, if you're hiking, those who are hiking, um, sometimes people, you know. Anyway, so algae toxins, um, that's for me to remember, they cause paralysis. Oh, I think the solane causes paralysis too. And paralysis obviously is serious. Paralysis is basically you're not able to move. Um, what's happening? Um, you're not able to move. Um, it's not good. Uh, okay, mercury in fish, heavy metal that causes toxin. Um, so another toxin is mercury. Um, the other toxin that we just talked about is red algae, and the other one is okay. Solane, that's in green potatoes. Red algae, um, that's found in algae. Um, and then 
the last one I just said was mercury. So those three are my main toxins we're talking about. And that one also also um, leads to, it's a neurotoxin. So basically attacks the nervous system, which is serious AF. Um, ooh, excuse my non-cursing cursing. Um, all right, which fish has higher levels of mercury? So these are the fishes that have higher levels of mercury, shark, swordfish, tidal fish, um, king mackerel. So one thing she was saying, and like I read a little bit in our book, um, it's usually the larger fish because obviously the larger fish are eating the smaller fish and smaller fish are eating, or medium fish are eating smaller fish. And so obviously the, the bigger fish um, will have higher levels of mercury. Um, who needs to stay away from mercury? Pregnant women. Why? Because obviously the mercury is very dangerous to the fetus. No. Okay. Um, what else? Uh, women and children. So children's bodies are not to fully developed yet. So um, you don't want them to have um, uh, ingested mercury in any way. Um, did we talk? To, oh, another thing that came up was um, the reason why kids or why babies can't have honey is honey has um, uh, um, it's not related to mercury. Uh, the the babies have, and this is not even on the exam, but I thought it was interesting. Um, babies, the honey has spores on it. Um, it's spores of a bacteria. I can't remember which one. It's not even on the exam, so. But anyway, it's interesting. I always wonder why babies can't have honey, but it's because the honey has those has spores on it, spores of whatever bacteria that is, um, and their bodies are not developed, so they're not but not their bodies are not developed to kind of withstand that bacteria. And going back to bacteria, that's not bacteria is not necessarily bad. Um, obviously, they you know we talk about gut health and having. Um, um, Part of having good gut health is having good bacteria and um, good bacteria can withstand the heat in our stomachs. And that's rep represented in yogurt. That's represented, um, good bacteria um, is represented in um, uh, probiotics. So what are some drugs given to animals? Oh, yes. Yeah, so we were talking about this. Um, so, uh, hormones, antibiotics, and arsenic <sighs> are given to, um, animals that then affect, in turn, affect us. And that is, uh, I guess type of foodborne illness. It, could, it affects us, um, uh, us as in humans who eat. So I eat. Say if I eat the steak, then the steak, say it's a steak with antibiotics and hormones. This cow's been, you know, pumped up with hormones. Then I in turn, um, you know, get affected. It's like that mercury that travels from small fish to medium fish to big fish, which is why very high levels of mercury are in the big fish. So if you eat the small fish, okay, um, you're you're okay. you're likely to be okay. But if you eat the big fish, obviously that will affect your um, your levels, therefore causing the problem. All right, so bovine growth hormone causes um, calf to produce more meat, more cheese. Oh, so actually the bovine growth hormone, oh, that has nothing to do with mad cow. Because again, bovine means cow. Um, so there's a cow growth hormone that they give to the certain cows um, that increases like the meat and, um, and I put cheese. 
I guess not just only for cows, for others too. All right. So, I mean, for other animals. So overuse of antibiotics leaves, um, oh, well, is that foodborne illness? I guess it could be. It could be basically the overuse of antibiotics in animals result in you being res uh, resistant to antibiotics when you need them. Say if you needed it. Um, may not be the specific antibiotics, but unbeknownst to you who is eating, who are eating that particular quality of meat, um, could be affected in that way. And so that when you do need treatment, antibiotics, it won't work, which is why if you're going to eat steak, go to a nice steakhouse, go get a nice piece of steak to cook if that's what you're going to do. And, um, it's the only way. All right. So we kind of touched also on organic foods. And so the definition of organic foods, um, talking about, talk about the definition is period is, uh, foods grown without the use of conventional pesticides, fertilizers, growth hormones, and any bio bioengineering or ionizing radiation. So organic foods are basically defined, defined as such. So, and they're also, once they've reached those requirements that they are grown um, without the use of con uh, conventional pesticides. Oh, how long has it been? All right. Conventional pesticides fertilizers, um, use of any hormones. Is that what it says? No. It says growth, um, but same thing. Um, bioengineering or ionizing radiation, and that's defined as organic. And organic actually, um, when you go to a grocery store, it's defined by that label because you have to get certification and all that. But you can also go to the farmer's market, so and talk to your farmer. Do you use pesticides? How do you grow the food? You know, people... Anyway, just an option. All right, so I went through all my notes for today for myself to know that is food safety. And then tomorrow I will go over my Thursday class. All right. If anybody listened to that, wow. Um, I hope you learned something from my studying. Anyhow, I'm going to end the live stream here. Yep.